Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amy Thompson. I'm the Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs. Thank you for joining us today for our, our final Future of Higher Education Forum of the Year. Uh, we've really covered a lot of topics this year, um, from crisis training to virtual reality in teaching, uh, using empathy uh, in our teaching strategies. And we're going to have a fantastic topic today in making sure that our textbooks that we use are student-centered. If you've been following the news, this is a very hot topic. Um, we're hearing lots of things about textbooks. In fact, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education just did uh, a piece on the future of higher education. And one of the things they talked about is, will we even use textbooks in the future? And in fact, uh, in the European Union, uh, they're looking at going to all open access journals and, and moving uh, away from textbooks more and more. So I think this is a very timely topic and something certainly we are discussing in terms of affordability and accessibility in higher education. So we have a, a fantastic speaker with us today, Dr. Matthew Libertor. He is a professor of chemical engineering in his fourth year at the University of Toledo and 14th as a faculty member. He's won numerous awards for teaching and education and has completed funded research in chemical engineering and engineering education and he's published over 80 papers. So I'm gonna turn it over to him today. Uh, this of course is being archived and live streamed, so we will have it on the Office of the Provost webpage that you can view later or share it with others. So let's give Matthew a warm uh, applause today. All right, thank you very much, Amy. I'm, I'm really excited. This is a, a topic near and dear to my heart, as my students know, who have used some of these tools that I've been building and working on. Uh, the other thing I'd be remiss not to do as an engineer to start to remind everyone that we're in a room, there are two exits in the back, a little safety <laughs> moment for us uh, to get started. Those of you online should locate your, your, your exits also. So um, We have a little one minute survey, so if you haven't scanned the code and give it a try, I know we have a few in the room that you grab the piece of paper, we'll look at that data throughout. So for me, it starts with, you know, it's not just all me, right? So it starts with the students, undergraduate students who are currently working with me, uh, past teaching assistants, colleagues, friends, uh, people at the company's iBooks that I'll talk about. I, I do mention some work that's funded through the National Science Foundation here at the University of Toledo. Uh, and then obviously there's a, a financial disclosure statement. The textbook is for sale. Um, I'll talk about uh, textbook costs a little bit. And so I do collect royalties, and there are some IRB protocols in place for some of the research that I'll be showing you. So with that out of the way, let's move on to participation, right? We had a survey. Hopefully you filled it out. I'm going to pull it up here in a minute and see what people responded. Here in the room, it's easy. You can get my attention, raise your hand, take questions. I do this in class all the time. No, that's not my phone number. But that is a phone number that's valid, and I will be able to take your text messages uh, via uh, the live feed or the, or the room or, or other things. So uh, take a second, you can write down the number and you can put in your questions and comments. So with that, let's talk about how the talk's going to go. So the talk has three main parts. It's really about three small talks. And so the first one's going to center on what a textbook is and how a textbook and student-centric learning, active learning should go together. And then I'm going to do two case studies. So two different platforms I've been working with or working on in the last few years. First using existing static text and then getting the students to use that and finally uh, fully interactive built from the ground up textbooks. So let's jump into the first part. So I've had this hypothesis I, I get some chuckles as soon as I put it up, okay? I get some eye rolling usually from faculty that students read textbooks. And uh, this is our overarching kind of theme for the talk, that if this exists, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry in the US alone, higher ed textbooks, that shouldn't they actually be opened and used? And how do we get students to do that and quantify that? Okay, so that's gonna be our uh, overarching hypothesis. All right, so then the next question was, what makes a great book? So let's go, go to the, the survey for the first, uh, first question here. It wasn't the first question in the survey. There we go, To Kill a Mockingbird. There's, there's a good example of a good book. Um, so good and evil, you know, I picked Harry Potter. Okay. 
So a great book, people think of a storyline and a story and other things, but I, I'm an engineer. Even though we're not going to have almost anything related directly to engineering, very broad uh, topics today in, in the textbook area, that you know, a great book doesn't make you think of engineering and equations and other things. It makes you think of, of stories, you know, of friendship and love and, and, and all of those emotions. Okay? You could think of a, a great book that was in the New York Times bestseller list that was written by a college professor, right? a university professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Angela Duckworth. Okay? Or you could think of a textbook. Okay? So when I give this talk, I usually stick in a textbook that's local. And so Professor Emeritus LeBlanc's textbook is here. I'm sure it's a great book. I've never taught that class, so I haven't used it. But it doesn't come to mind when we think of great books to put textbooks into that category. Okay. So that's our first question. And so tying into that idea of students read the textbook, reading is going to take effort. And effort is part of our equations for learning, in, in my opinion. Okay? So, so a couple of authors listed at the bottom. I have full citations at the end of the talk that, that you'll be able to see. But I like equations. I'm an engineer. So when we combine talent with effort, we can create skills. And with those skills, we can put an additional effort, and achievements are possible. They're not guaranteed, but we need to put in effort. And so effort counts twice. Okay. So can we quantify effort related to textbooks and course readings? That, that's really what we're going to try to do within the, the case studies we're going to talk about. And so I think we have a good idea of what a textbook is if we're a higher education faculty member or student. It's, it's very exciting. It's a manual of instruction. Okay. So we all have them, no matter what classes we teach. If, it, if it's a broad class, it, it, it usually has a textbook. And we know that it all has the same parts. And in engineering, we always have derivations and examples and worked out things and, and everything else. But everybody has definitions. And, and then there, there are other things that are, are the nuts and bolts of a textbook. And so that's not going to change if we modernize what we think a textbook is. And so that's our, our definition there. So how do textbooks relate to learning? Bloom's taxonomy gives us a, a framework for kind of defining lower and higher level skills. And so starting at the bottom, you go from remembering to understanding up to applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And so how do we tie textbooks into this kind of framework or thinking with, with higher education students and with learning? And so in, in my opinion, most textbooks usually stick to the remembering and understanding. They're very definition-centric. Okay? So if we learn our new terms and we understand what they mean, that's, that's enough for most textbooks. But I think our goal as you know, a higher education community is really to push up, right? to get to applying and analyzing, to do some evaluating. Hard to create a textbook, but I'll get to that also. Okay. So we want to see not only the remembering and understanding, but being able to move our way up into the other categories. So how do we do that? And then two slides on pain points, things that I think make us uncomfortable with textbooks in higher education specifically. So here we have year on the, on the x-axis going from 20, uh, 1997 to 2017. And the y-axis here tells you the price change. And so there's a whole bunch of things here. TVs are at the bottom. They've gotten cheaper over the last 20 years. Okay? And then if we start working our way up, we hit inflation. Food and beverages are, are kind of our inflation metric. And then we keep going up. And there's tuition. There's textbooks. And then there's hospital services. So inflation here, textbooks way up here, almost the top. Okay. And then tuition right underneath. So we can't let one go without the other. Okay. Hospital services will let the, the faculty at the medical campus address that one. That's not in my area of expertise. But what we can see here is that in the last couple of years that this was done, which would be like 2015 to 2017, the textbook price change had actually flattened off. It was showing a lot of oscillations. So there's clearly disruptions going on in this area. And I'm going to talk about at least one of those here today. The other thing that is commonly run into with textbooks is that they're static in many ways. 
and especially with problems that you work. In science and engineering, especially we assign homework problems. And they're the same homework problems in the same textbook year to year. And so, you know, a number of years ago we did a study, it wasn't related to this, but we took this data where it was homework success across a, a class of about 150 students. And then if they did all textbook problems, or some textbook problems and some other problems, or some other problems. So we were si trying to make the point that textbook problems, the solution manual was out there, right? Someone got it, posted it for the textbook, and so the majority or all of the students had access to it. Is that legal or ethical? That's a different question, but that's, that was the state of affairs then. And so they did pretty well when they had the, the solution manual, about 85%. And then we mix some problems in, it goes down. And if we don't give any problems where they have a solution manual, it's significantly lower. And if we put error bars in this, right, the, the, the all alternative problems was about three standard deviations lower. So a very significant difference if you're looking at this statistically. So we have cost, we have solutions manual dilemma, and just the general static nature of a textbook, we really um, need to improve to put the students in the center. So the, the last topic of the first part of the talk is related to technology. And so in about the 14th century, we started as professors lecturing. And then it was the student's job to absorb and learn the material. And so we got to the 21st century, and we, we got really, really smart. We would lecture, and we'd record it, and then we'd put it online, and then you know we would have the students way down here again. Okay, and so. One way we were trying to get away, away from the solutions manual dilemma is we decided we would put the students at the center. Okay? We would have the students find an online video. They would write a problem about the class, tie the video's events into what we're having in the class. And then we'd, we'd use those problems in class. And so we called it YouTube Fridays. We were using YouTube videos. We did it mostly on Fridays. Now we do it all the time. Almost every class has a YouTube video, uh, depending on the course and things. So I thought I'd give an example of, of a YouTube problem that we've used over the years. So we're going to start with this. There's no leaking in the roof, and the roof collapsed this morning. And so now you've gotten their attention. Okay. Well, they've gotten their own attention, right? Because the students will pick the videos and do it. And so here we were doing things at the beginning of a semester in an engineering course about unit conversions and about looking up properties and other things. And so the questions were, so how much snow is it by volumes? How much snow is it by mass? Oh, and if it was that much snow, how would it, would it fill this room? Uh, you know, these are the questions. And so productively use your devices to figure this out. So the, this is what we call an engineering estimate problem because there's no real correct answer. Go ahead. So are these questions that the students came up with? Correct. Yeah, so the, the question was, is this a student-written question? Yes, it was. Uh, a student-written question. I have several hundred of these um, as part of that NSF project. We're going to hopefully start disseminating them. My student's sitting there. He knows that that's something we're working on. Okay. So the thing is, what we'll do is I'll take a screenshot, put it on a slide like this, let the students work in their teams of twos, threes, fours, and they'll come up with answers. And like this one has no correct answer. Okay. I don't know how much volume of snow there was in the Metrodome when, it, when, the, when the roof collapsed. And the mass, that's even more unknown. Because if you've ever shoveled snow like we have here in Toledo, like we have if it comes in December or if it comes in March, it is a very different density, right? So the mass will vary dramatically. Okay, so what happens with the students is they think they can't do this. And then we just keep priming them to, to, okay, just put some numbers down, start calculating, start doing it. And then I'll come to the next class, we'll have all the data, we'll have 30 teams do it. And what happens is about 75 to 80 percent of the teams will converge to, you know, about the same answer. Of course, you know, it's going to be within probably 50% or something, but it's about the same answer. And year to year, we do this with a whole number of problems, and we can do it. 
we can also make these problems more closed, uh, but also based on videos. And so that's part of our research project that we're working on right now. So there's a way just to put the students at the center of getting rid of the solution manual dilemma from the textbook's perspective. The other way you could do it is just, okay, I don't want to have a textbook anymore. Let's just have the students write it. That'll be the, the semester project. Okay. And so some of my colleagues in chemical engineering um, have done this. They created a wiki. They had a kind of an upper level undergraduate, graduate level course in a bioengineering, biomaterials area. And so they've created this textbook. And so the students get a lot of, of you know, time doing research, doing writing, and then obviously working on others' pieces, right? So you see what a good piece looks like, and you can edit yours and, and make comments on the others, and that constructive feedback and commenting. So we're going to tie that into one of our case studies, too. All right, so we're getting to the end of the first section. We want to tie in best practices in, in education and learning. So that falls under the guise of what I call active learning. Active learning puts the students at the center of the learning experience. And here is a review paper. Here's some data from a review paper showing density or, or how frequent this event occurs and the percent of students who fail the course on the X. And what we see is that the, the blue uh, distribution is much farther to the right with less students failing than the orange portion where it's a lecture-based class. So making the students do something has a great benefit in terms of their final success in the course. So how do we take active learning technology and textbooks and put them all together? So that's where we're, we're going to go. So I consider textbooks a 20th century technology. We can start back when we started to write things down thousands of years ago. We had the printing press come along in the 1400s. And then higher ed textbooks came around about 100 years ago. Okay, so it's actually a relatively young technology from that perspective. But today, things are, are much more fluid and much more interactive using these touchscreen and uh, you know, wireless devices that we have that are so common. And so can we take the textbook here into the 21st century? So that's, that's the challenge. So the two case studies are going to be at this threefold interface. The Penrose Triangle it kind of shows that everything is mixed together. We're going to take some technology. That's a key piece. We're going to take textbooks and the material that we would have in the textbooks and put the students at the center. Make them do something with the textbook and have that be just implicit in the textbook world. OK. So what fraction of students read the textbook? That was one of the other survey questions. Let's see, let's see what the responses say here. Let's see, we got half of the respondents say 20 to 40 percent. And no one went higher than 60 percent. And a third of the respondents said 0 to 20 percent. So I think that we're not very optimistic on how many students read the textbook. And it's a multi billion dollar industry. So when I started working on this six or seven years ago, uh, trying to rethink what a textbook was in my field, I asked that question. I've been looking around the literature for higher ed. Can we find a reading rate? You can find giant surveys that students will self-report. That's OK. I found one really good paper in, in the year 2000 in the teaching of psychology. And they did 16 years of work. I always joke with the graduate students, I'm glad this wasn't my PhD thesis. OK? So they 900 students over 16 years, they did a pop quiz each term. And this is the original data. And so it shows mean compliance or readership. You know, these are readers as a function of year from 1981 to 1997. And what you can see is that if you were in college in the early 80s, you were a reader, 80 plus percent. Okay? And then since you know, mid 80s when they kept doing it, we, we've kind of leveled off somewhere in here in this 20 to 40 window. Okay? So the, the pop quiz once a semester was the way they were tracking reading. And so the, the pop quiz had two parts. The first question was, true or false, did you do the reading? Okay? So you couldn't be a reader if you didn't say true. And then you had to show some kind of competence in the second half of the quiz, which was about the reading content. I think it was only like 50% correct or something. So not, not anything that was, was a 90% to be a reader. And so 
we have this 20 to 40 band. This is what we call our base rate. If you, uh, you know, know Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, a base rate is very important for us to set and compare um, other things. So our base rate here, from what I can find, is about 20 to 40 percent of the students will read a textbook. So we'll see how we do with these technologies. All right, so first section is behind us. Do we want to take any questions here? Is it textbooks being kind of a static technology and, and students, most students nowadays, prefer their handheld device and this interaction component? And, and I think I'm going to address that within these two case studies. And so we can't get rid of static texts entirely, right? We're going to need words on a page in many, many cases. And so how, 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 do we, how do we, what's the best way to say it? How do we bring the students into, into that, in, into being engaged and excited about reading the text in some way? Okay. I have a text message question, so I'm reading it over here. Ah, so, so technology in the classroom is, is kind of what the theme of, of the question that came in via text. And so you'll see that, that the tools I have here will integrate right into the classroom as well as being outside the classroom techniques. And so I'll try to, I'll try to emphasize that as we go through the case studies. So that's good. Terry, go ahead. Yeah, right, exactly. So, so how do you quantify a student reads a textbook? I, I don't know in a traditional paper textbook sense. That's a hard thing. So the pop quiz way is a good way. Reading quizzes is another way that's out there that's been done. Uh, in terms of that study that was done, the yes category, mm -hmm. is there a certain minimum percentage of the reading done that qualifies? Right, right. So they had to score on the pop quiz part about the content 50% or higher. So they did have to show that they read and knew the material. Yeah. So there was a competence. Exactly. It wasn't just a true false pop quiz. It had, it had a competence part to it. So very good. Very good question. All right. So now we're going to take static text, including textbooks, and put the students right on top of it, right inside of it, and let them talk to each other while they're being introduced to a new topic. Okay. So this uh, piece of technology is called Perusal. It was, it's been designed and built and is, is run by, by a group that started out of Har Harvard, Eric Mazur, who's, who's known in the, in the peer instruction area. It was uh, some of the, the researchers in his uh, lab that started this. And it's a web-based tool, not surprisingly, where you comment on static text and it's asynchronous, so students will comment at the same time or at different times. And then they, you know, they have a machine learning algorithm that'll read the comments and say, oh, is that a good comment, a mediocre comment, or a bad comment? And so we'll give examples of those for, for this technique. This is a screenshot of my class. So I have the textbook down here, even though it doesn't have the title of the textbook. It just says Transport Phenomena, University of Toledo, um, because it's a custom textbook. So I'll talk about that in the next couple slides. The rest of these are journal papers that, that I use. This is a graduate course in, in, in fluid mechanics. And so let's keep the, the topic on textbooks. We have major publisher textbooks. Many of us author for them. This is a Wiley textbook that, that traditionally has been used for the class uh, that I was teaching and using this for. Except most publishers now are like, OK, if it's a digital copy, it's going to be cheaper. And in my case, I'm not using all the chapters in this transport phenomena book. And so if I make a custom book, as I showed you on the last slide, I don't need all the chapters. And so I can only just make the custom book for the chapters that I need in my semester and for my students. That, of course, makes a shorter book, and it makes it more uh, inexpensive. Uh, the price goes down. Perusal doesn't cost anything, 
Um, but you buy the book through perusal, and so they obviously get a cut in that. I don't know what the business model actually is, but that's my intuition from working on it and working with it. You can still print some of it, and, and you have it forever, right? It's in the perusal platform. Not only is the book there, all of your comments, all of the things you wrote about it when you were learning will help you trigger and hopefully jump back in more easily. Okay. So this textbook, if you look on Amazon or on most marketplaces, you can get it for about $75 to $85. When I made it my custom one with less of the chapters, uh, last fall it was $33 to buy or $25 to rent. And talking to the students, I, didn't, I don't think I asked them or surveyed them. I think most of them decided that $8 wasn't enough to buy, that most of them rented. And so we were about a, you know, about a third of the price by customizing the book and still using a major publisher textbook that's been around for all, uh, several decades in this case. You can use free textbooks. So my area of expertise as an engineer is in the area called rheology. Okay? So it's theology with an R. So the joke always goes that you know, as rheologists, we're close to God. Okay? And so John Knapp in, in our library here at the University of Toledo, you know, has helped me help me maneuver some of these things. But we have some databases. One's called Novel from Elsevier. Uh, the other one's called Access Engineering from another major publisher. And they have a bunch of full text books there. And so they're part of our library. So they're, you know, free for us to use for educational purposes. That's what our library is here for. And so they're already paid for. So there's no additional textbook fee for your course if you're using them. And so I've used chapters from this book as part of the same course I was talking about. So they're free, quote unquote. They've been paid for already. They're not actually free. Okay. The last thing is to use the library again. And if it's a specialized course, an elective course, other things, journal articles. Okay. We can load journal articles very easily into the perusal platform and comment right on top of journal articles. So a lot of times, if you want to build in current events related to course content through journal articles, newspaper articles, other things, this is another way that you could do it. So it's pretty much text type independent in terms of, of the content here. So what does it actually look like? How do the students use it now that we know what it is and, and how it works? Okay. So here on the left is a page of the textbook. In an engineering textbook, it's good. It's got equations. It's got a figure, some drawings. It's got a caption. And you can see that some of the text is highlighted throughout here. And so wherever it's highlighted, there's a comment that the student has generated. Okay? I only have about a dozen students in the class in, in any year for this graduate course. And so the number of comments uh, over a few pages is, is a handful of comments per page. This is actually page 48. There's four comments on, the, on, this, on this page. But as the instructor, I can see all these comments, and, and I'll show you some more examples in the next couple of slides. So it's very easy. You go into the tool, you highlight a few words, and then you put your comments in. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, detail what these comments are as we go. So here's one comment string, just to be an example. This is the one time, I think, in the talk where we have engineering words on the page, a lot of them. Okay? So we're talking about molecular momentum transport. If you don't know what that is, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But what we can see is that the first comment by student AA, their initials are usually here, okay, is that this is two questions about the reading. And then question BB responds to that question uh, to, to student AA, and they, they got a check. That means that some student other than BB said that this response was really helpful to me. So they're they're making this asynchronous interaction between each other. You can see there's also a little question mark up in the upper left so that you indicate that you had a question. And then continuing the string after BB's response, CC came up with a, a slightly different question. And then student DD you know, responded to CC. And you can actually call each other up. Okay? So you can tag your comments to say, I'm responding to you. And then the notification system uh, tells that student that, they, that their comment was responded to. The other features that, that are here that I want to highlight, and so you can see that the first comment here says score of 2. The comment down here says score of 2. But the two on the right both say score of 1. Okay. What we've noticed over using this the last few years is that a short comment is, is generally going to get 1, unless it's you know, some gibberish. Uh, and a longer comment is more likely to be 2 points. Uh, but the, the algorithm is looking for 
that it's using the right vocabulary that ties into the words used in the text. Okay. So that's just one example. So I let the students loose on this the first time I used it and just said, okay, here's a chapter of the book. It might be 25, it might be 40 pages. Put five to seven comments in, I'd, I'd set a number. Okay. And then I'd let them go and I'd let it auto grade and we'd see what the grades were. And the students were like, this is weird. This is uncomfortable. I need a little bit more help, right? So there's different ways you can do this. One way is I, I gave them four kind of templates that they should alternate between. So when they're writing a comment, the comment could be a question, or the comment can just pull out something that they find confusing. So those are things that I need help with, the first two. And then you know, an H would indicate, oh, I'm going to help a teammate. You know, we had those check marks and other things. We can, we can help each other get through these readings. And the other way is, is re restating, rephrasing. So paraphrasing, especially with graduate students doing literature reviews and anyone doing research and looking at, at other people's work, needs to have the ability to paraphrase and to restate and to, to kind of uh, understand ideas in their own work. And so by framing the, the types of comments, it seemed to help the students. The other way that, that is very easy to do beforehand for the faculty is to have some prompts at different points in the chapters or in the readings. If you have a prompt, then the students can very easily respond to the questions about whatever you ask. So there's different types of comments. So the machine learning algorithm, in my opinion, after reading probably about two, three thousand comments over the last few years from students across the books, it pretty much is right on. So a good strong comment will, re will be two. Uh, a complete you know, you know, sentence fragment or something else will get a zero, and something really short in between will usually get one point. And so I felt very confident in letting the machine learning algorithm go. I can't override, and usually once or twice a semester, I'll change a one point to a two point because uh, you know, professional judgment comes into play there. Another question. Ah. They have this work, or, or like, was there a way that you could take a large class and divvy it up into smaller yes. groups so that? So, the question is about class size. So, if I have 100 students or 200 students, can I use this? It would just be complete chaos, right? Everyone's highlighting the same four words and putting comments in. Yes, so the way it works really well for big classes, I haven't done it this way, but I've seen others who have done it this way, is to, to break the class into groups of about 20 or 25 students, as I think the number that is generally used, and then they can only see each other's comments within their subgroup. So 20 to 25 students within several hundred even. Have, it, has, it has been a successful tool there. As a professor, I don't know how I could read 200 students' worth of comments um, and, and make this kind of, uh, of judgment. And so now we have graded comments. So in order to get that effort we started with at the beginning, we have to give a little carrot, right? We have to give a little incentive, which is, in my case, 5 to 10% of the final grade will be related to the reading. And in this case, using perusal, it's this machine-graded score for X number of comments for the reading. It may be three comments for a journal paper. It might be seven comments for a chapter of, of a textbook. And what we see with a graduate class, not surprisingly, everybody does at least the minimum number of comments. The graduate course. I'm sure it probably wouldn't be that way with an undergraduate or a bigger class. But what we also see is uh, you know, our actual comment rate is 40 to 50% higher over the course of a semester than was required by me as the instructor to earn their grade for the reading. And so why is that? You know, in any single assignment, it's usually about 70% of the students are doing extra comments. The reason that is, is that they get scored automatically in real time, I think about once an hour. So they can go back in, okay, I made my seven comments on the chapter. I go back in, I only have eight out of 10 for the reading assignment. Okay, that's okay, but I want 10 out of 10, right? That's how I got to graduate school. I'm gonna put extra effort in. And so, the way the algorithm works is that it takes the best seven comment scores. So they go in and then put another three comments, hoping to get some twos to replace some ones, and get that full score. 
And so what I saw, I want to say this past fall, I think 9 of the 10 or 10 of the 11 students had a 100% score at the end of the semester because they just kept commenting until they got a 10. Okay. So this is not only effort in looking at the reading, but they're going in and, and re-engaging more than once so that they can earn a very small amount of their grade. The carrot is not very big here. The other thing that Perusal, being an online web-based tool, will just spit out analytics for you. And so they have it set up to do this for your reading. So I just took a snapshot of a, of a chapter of the textbook. And here we are going from September 7th to September 20th along the Y, and then all the hours of the day along the X. And what we see is that red is a lot of reading. So right here, everybody was reading. And then nobody read for an entire week. And then it was clearly due somewhere around here, because then all the reading happens right beforehand. Okay? So not surprisingly, the reading happens right beforehand. And with college students, a lot of the reading happens 8, 9, 10, 11 at night. Okay? I'm asleep, but the students are definitely not. Okay? And so the mystery here was, why is it read and then there's nothing for a week? Well, that was when the last reading assignment was due. So the students just kept going into the next chapter or the next section uh, from the one before. So they were reading and getting it done right before the due date from the last reading. They just kept going a few more pages and made some more comments. So this gives you just a quick snapshot of when students are doing their reading. How much are they reading is also quantified. It's quantified for us in terms of views and time views. I'm not sure how much I believe a lot of this, but this is, at least gives you a, a qualitative flavor. So page views are the blue bars, and then the up and down uh, orange uh, data here give you the time. And so the time goes from about zero to eight minutes, the peak being eight minutes, with most of the times being here in about the one to, one to three minutes area for this chapter. But what's interesting, even if you're not going to read a few hundred comments before class, you could pull this up and go, oh, wow, looks like pages 89, 90, and 91 got a lot of views and a lot of time. What was that? You know, because maybe you hadn't looked at back at that book because you've taught it three, four, or five times. You haven't, you know, you don't remember what's on that page of the book. You can go and see where the students were putting in the time and effort, and that may actually help you adjust your class that period and that day. And the not other surprising part, it's a long chapter and it starts to tail off about the last 10 pages. Okay. The other thing with the grades, which I didn't put in the slides, is that you can scale the grades according to how the, the comments are spaced across the chapter. And so I usually, I think, put about 10 to 15 percent fudge factor in the grade. So if they commented, it's a 40 page chapter and there's only comments in the first four pages, they really can't get a 10 out of 10. They have to show that they read across the entire chapter. So it's a very interesting kind of scalar. And then after the fact um, of, of the semester, you can play with that, how much it's scaled across the chapter, and it'll change the scores. And so I've played with that after, after the semester ended to see what it looks like. All right, so that's the second part of the talk. We took static texts, and we put students the onus on the students to start commenting and discussing it amongst themselves using this online tool called Perusal. The tool itself scores it and grades it for you, so not a huge faculty time investment in that way. The nice part that I really like as a faculty member is the ability to not only use library resources like books and journal articles, but also customize a standard textbook that the students would generally pay for the whole thing. And so, what we saw here is that the effort is there in order to get your, your highest score. Go ahead, question. When you use free textbooks, does the service still charge students? Is there a fee on top? There is not right now. Okay. I, I, so I've asked that question. So is there a fee if you're using all free resources or library resources? There isn't right now. And I know some faculty have used it for, say, group meeting. Your research group is meeting. You've got undergraduates. You've got graduate students. You've got postdoctoral students. We're going to review the latest papers. You can do it here on, on the platform, and there's not a charge as, of, as, of, as far as I know right now. Oh. So let me get rid of that. Another question. Go ahead. Uh, 
Um, you could do that by seeding questions yourself. Yeah, so you could go in at the fifth page and the fifteenth page and put in a thought question that you found appropriate for that material. Yes, that would be very easy to do. So, so putting in prompts distributed to help the students along in the chapter is certainly an easy thing to do. Not necessary from my experience, but, um, but certainly very doable. I mentioned something I couldn't quite catch. Okay. I, I waited yeah. So the algorithm, so the question is how, how the scoring goes. So the algorithm does weigh the score across the pages that are, are, are read. Yeah, so if all the comments are in the first four pages of the chapter or the last four pages of the chapter, it won't be able to give a full score if you have the weighting factor for distribution be high enough, 10, 20 percent or something. Yeah, very, very good question. All right, the last part of the talk. One of the other survey questions, senses. When we're talking about interaction, we're talking about engaging multiple senses. So let's see what the, what the, uh, what the responses were here. We got 90% of the respondents said sight is the one that's most important for learning and memory. And I'll agree. Okay. So this is one uh, book that, that I use as a reference, but talking about vision and learning being dominant. Okay. In terms of neural activity, it's about half with sound and touch being next. And so if we could do sight, sound, and touch all in our textbook, we would be way ahead of the game, as opposed to something static sitting on a page where we're only looking at it. Okay. I'm not sure about you know smell and taste. I don't know if we have too many majors here at the University of Toledo uh, with smell and taste. That's outside of my, my expertise here. Okay. So we're, we're going to try to engage sight, but try to engage other senses too. And we'll show you how to do that with interactive textbooks. And we're going to not only introduce what an interactive textbook is, at least in the Zybooks platform that I author in, um, but what data we get out of that. It's very different than this, this earlier data where we had static text and we were doing comments on top of it, or we were doing pop quizzes. This is a very much a direct uh, measurement of reading throughout the semester. So Zybooks is a faculty started company in 2012, and so I author for them. I, my books are, are about two of their, they're about three dozen fully interactive books. They fall into the guise of computer science, math, and engineering. Half a million students, hundreds of institutions have used them. And the key that's different here with interactive is that not only are the students getting feedback in real time, the faculty are too. And so everybody knows where they at are in respect to the, the textbook reading, as well as auto-graded exercises. And I'll show you how those all work also. So we're going to start with uh, about 10 minutes, probably, of how, the, how authoring an interactive textbook, uh, in my mind, is working. So it goes from definitions through demonstrations. Demonstrations traditionally are derivations and figures. And so we use animations. And I'll show you what some animations look like. Uh, then there's practice. So instead of more text in a traditional textbook setting, we have practice questions, what we call learning questions. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then finally, let's step back a little bit as, as the author of the textbook and let them try it themselves. So we have what we call challenge questions. And then once that set of concepts has you know, been explored in those four steps, we go back and do it again for the next set. Okay. So we have to have the boring slide up front because that's the definition one. So what we see here is that, in general, Zybook's uh, motto is less text, more action. So you see some short paragraphs. Here we're talking about mass, moles, and volume. And then there's some definitions. So here we put them in a table. Density is defined. Molecular weight is defined. They have symbols. They have examples. So the table is a nice, quick way to do that. The bold terms are indexed like you'd expect any textbook to have. Obviously, obviously very quickly searchable in, in an online web-based platform. But what's very different about it, our, our interactive books at Zybooks is that this feedback button's in the bottom right of almost every one of these activities. And so if there's a typo or a bug in it, students will catch it right away. And the nice thing about being a fully online interactive platform is that Zybooks will correct it usually the same day. And so we'll go in, we'll fix the typo, we'll get it pushed out, and everybody will have the, the latest fixed version of the page. 
So the static text is there, less text, a little more focused through tables and other ways that you can format a web-based document. So once we've defined, we want to demonstrate using animations. And so what is an animation? So I got a couple of movies in the next slides, but uh, just describing it. So instead of a derivation that may go half a page or more, the derivation is produced in steps. So the students have to click, see the first step appear, things can move around, be canceled, other things. And so they have to step through all the steps. We can build static figures. And so instead of that, that, that figure, like we had in the textbook earlier, or say you had a figure where you're looking at liquids and gases or other things, that would just be static. It's pressure on this axis, it's temperature on this axis, it says liquid here, it says gas here. But here in an animation setting, you hit start on the animation, the screen clears, and then it tells you, okay, we have to have, we're, in this case, we have pressure on the y-axis, we have temperature on the x-axis, and it builds it step by step. And then finally, we can build in some physical processes. So I have a good example of that in the next couple of slides. So I was curious about this animation thing. I was not very comfortable with it when I started authoring the Zy books. And eventually, I, I really come to, to love the animation medium. But the first time we, we used the book, 2016, I had an end of the semester survey, like most of us do, to get some feedback on lots of different things related to the course. But the one related to animations was like overwhelming. Almost every student was like, not only did I watch the animations, which our primary click analytics I'll show you ha says, that almost everyone was like, yeah, I went back and at least watched one more than once. So we have reruns now, okay? So we thought, you know, with, with everything being recorded and digitally streamed, you know, reruns can come back now in our textbook. So, you know, trying to not do engineering content here, I picked an animation from a spreadsheet. And so this is going to loop a couple of times. So as you can see here, the, the, instead of a screencast, say, of, of, of the desktop for a spreadsheet training kind of education thing, here the, the, the spreadsheet is a much cleaner, simpler. It doesn't matter if you're on a Mac or Windows. It has a much simpler idea. So you start the animation by clicking start. So this is not only watching, they have to click. Okay, so we got touch and watching. Then it steps through some actions. Here they're typing into cell A1. And below the, the animation itself are captions. So it's fully captioned. Uh, very nice for the students to read the caption to tell you what's happening. The second step, it, it, it executes a formula uh, in cell B2. And then step three kind of overlays some commentary. So what's the difference between the displayed content, the 18 on the screen, and the formula behind it, what we call stored content. And so that's one example how you got to click through to get through the animations. And you don't get your reading points unless you've clicked through every step of the animation. And believe me, that has not stopped students. So here's another example of an animation, something many people are very familiar with. My colleagues know I don't drink coffee, I don't like coffee, but I thought this was a, a, a great animation for, for this type of audience. We use blue and red to show cold and hot water. And then we show things moving around. So we put the coffee grounds in the filter. This is a section about filtration. Okay. Then we put the hot water through the filter, and we make the coffee. And so people who are in graphic design or arts or other things, this is very crude, right? It's not beautiful, but it gets the points across about filtration and what the physical process is it and where you see it in everyday life. And I think that's really important. So with each time a step completes, they have to click again. So most of these are, are between two and six steps that they have to click through to get through any single animation. And so I thought making the little coffee pot was pretty cool and neat. But yeah, go ahead. This, do they provide software for making the animation? Ah. So how do you make an animation within the Zybooks platform? So the beauty of it on the student's end is that it's all a web-based book, fully HTML5 compliant, no plugins or any additional software. So it runs in the web browser. How do we build it? I have a web-based tool that's proprietary Zybooks. It's patent pending things in there that I just build the animations. It's not very different than a presentation software like a PowerPoint building an animation. So there's move commands, and there's appear and disappear and fade. Um, the, the normal animation commands. Very similar to animations like I've done in this slideshow here today. Yeah, another question over here. Yeah. You said that it was interesting that students were watching the animations more than once. Correct. Do you have a, do you have a sense of why that is? 
Ah. So why would students watch an animation again? That, that's, a, that's the question, and I think that's a great question. Do I know for sure? No. Do I know that in certain situations what I've seen? Sure. Uh, one situation is, OK, there's a lot of spreadsheet-related animations, and they need to use those calculations in their homework problem. They'll go back and say, oh, I need to put this number here and this number here, and my formula goes here. And they'll rewatch those animations so they can do that spreadsheet and solve that homework problem. So that's one example that I've seen in office hours or in other times during the semester. Okay. So that's the animation part. So instead of figures, now we have moving pictures. After define and demonstrate, we go into the practice part, which is learning questions. So these have different flavors. So matching, true, false, multiple choice, and short answer. So there's no penalty here. So they're just going to do it until they get it right. So I'll start with a matching. Again, using spreadsheets as an example. Here we're listing cell names. And how many cells is that many cell names, a list or a group of cells? And so here they, they drag and drop the different blue boxes. Here they got one wrong. And so you drag it again. They, of course, it was me clicking as I made the little animation would be. So here. They, they get to, to finally get them all right. They're all correct. If they want to practice that the day before the quiz or the exam, they hit the reset button. It resets. It shuffles them all. And they get to match again. Okay. Each time they match correctly, there's a little bit of commentary on why or how that's right. And in, there, in this case, it's just listing how many cells it was being counted in that cell list or cell group in a spreadsheet. Okay, So that's one example of a question set. The other one is. Uh, another just example spreadsheet with different numbers and different cells, and, and the question's asking, where is the number two? If I want to put the number two in cell A1, which other cell would I call? And so you click the first answer, and you're wrong. So if you're not even trying reading, this is how you do it. You just click the first answer, it's wrong. You click the second answer, it's wrong. You click the third answer, it's right. That's how you get your reading points. Okay. Here, we're going through each of the, the descriptions on why it's wrong. It usually prompts you on how to get it right. And so this is where less text, when you look at the screen initially, from the author's perspective, is way more text. Because each answer, you have to write a very unique explanation. And you try to put some you know, misconceptions in there. So if they click it, it kind of calls out that this is wrong. And so it's looping again through the, through the different choices and getting it, it wrong or right. And then when we get to the third answer and it gets it right, this little cell here turns into an orange check. So then the students see, OK, I've done that. Match or that multiple choice exercise, now I have my reading points for that question. And then each question gets another orange check once they've gotten it right. So the matching and the multiple choice work together there. And then finally, once they've practiced, now we want them to actually do some work. So in this case, I picked a spreadsheet problem that the students have struggled with in the first couple of years that we've used this question. We're doing you know, high school mathematics question here, doing a logarithm with a base. And so it's not a hard thing to do in a spreadsheet. There's a log function. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just toggling the question. And so you can see the number is changing and the number is moving. So the formula they would have to write, if I move my cursor off, there we go. The formula they write on the bottom left changes with the locations of the cells. And the value changes with the value in the cells. So the, both of those things change with every iteration of the problem. So each student has the same level of difficulty, but a different problem. And if they get the first attempt wrong, it just toggles a new iteration, and they do it till they get it right. And so we've been monitoring how many attempts it takes to get each question right over several hundred questions throughout the book. I call it perpetual practice. So the students are entering the value or the formula in this situation? In this, they're entering both. So there's two questions. They have to get both the formula and the value correct in this question. So there's lots of single answer, multi-answer, multiple choice, different flavors of these so challenge does it activities. Does allow you to provide a range of correct answers in case there's an error? Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So there's a tolerance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if, it, if it's 2.34 and it's 2.37, do they get it right? Almost always. So the tolerance is usually 2 or 3% on a numeric answer. If it needs to be bigger, I'll usually 
uh, play with it until it's, it's more comfortable. It's as much as 5%. So f plus or minus 5% is a pretty big window. But for some more complicated uh, calculations, that's, that's certainly necessary to get everybody to have a uh, different number. So if you wanted to know the answer, that's the log function in the spreadsheet. Okay. Review your logarithms if you haven't done them in a while. Okay. So now let's get to the analytics part, the data that the interactive textbook gives us. Obviously, the click data is there, and we've been kind of showing that all along. So we call that reading participation. That's the upper left. We've been talking about reruns with the animation, so we'll quantify that. And then with the challenge activities, not only do the students get it right, how long does it take them to get it? Not only in number of attempts, we can actually look at how long it takes. And I have one example of that uh, at the end. All right, so we had our base rate of 20 to 40% reading at the beginning from the literature, and I'll compare our data to that. And the carrot in our case has been 5% for the reading and 5% for the challenge activities. The reading, I require 100%. The grade's out of 100%. The challenge activities, I give a fudge factor. So if there's 300 questions in the book, I may give them 10 or 15 free questions throughout the semester. So then if they don't get one, they're not stressing over, I didn't get my entire grade. So putting a little fudge factor in on the challenge activity is good. So we, we give about 10% of the total course grade. So here are my students on the y-axis from 0 to 100% of the class. So all the students are accounted for here. Here's a couple of sections of the book early in the semester. Green is good. Yellow, OK. Red, not good. So I think it's the color scheme we're familiar with. So the first time we did this, the readership was 50%. And we had another 10% that at least clicked through some of the sections. And so I took this data, went to class that day. I was like, all right, we're beating the 20 to 40% that the literature says college students read textbooks. That's great. I still think we can do better, but this is a good start. Okay, so next class we'll have a couple more sections due. That's what these numbers indicate, 1.3 to 1.6. So what happened? We went back to being college students, and it's a textbook. Why would I need to open it? Why would I need to look at it? Okay. We went to 20% reading and about 20 to 30% kind of reading. So that really agrees well with the previous work in the literature. So I, of course, bring that to class the second time and say, well, that was awful. I know we can do better than that. So then after that, after you keep bringing the data to the class and showing it in real time with you know, about 100 students in, in a cohort here, you know, we get very big green bars and very little else. Okay. And actually what I've seen over, over dozens of sections, over uh, about 300 students in the, in the three cohorts that I have data, is that if they start reading a section, the probability that they get 100% reading for that section is, is like 99%. They never stop without completing the entire section. So very, very nice yeah. data to see. Go ahead, John. Absolutely. So the question is, are the students just going to click through as fast as they can to get from top to bottom? One, they can't really do that with the animations. The, it has to run through each step, so that slows them down a little bit. Two, the analytics team at Zybooks has published a paper related to this, and what they saw is that as much as 3% of the students are trying to game the system, but when they're, they're given this opportunity to engage with the book, you know, they're seeing 97 to 99% of the students not trying to game the system and going through as fast as they can. The data is in our favor in that one. It's a very relevant question, though. So what is a manageable chunk? Chunks relevant to what's called cognitive load theory, a good, good learning idea. So a manageable chunk for an instructor would be, OK, this was the chapter or six sections that would do for reading today and challenge activities tomorrow. So the reading was due. So here we have in orange that the reading rates were 90%. Actually, they're a little higher than this. A couple of students withdraw before I took this data. Okay. And there's the challenge activity scores. Well, that's pitiful. Right? Only got about half the class doing the first three sections of challenge activities, and then we're like a quarter to a third correct. So we're, we're either not getting it, or it's the day before it's due, and no one's even attempted it. And so the data shows, if we click to the next slide, when it's due, they've all gone and done it. It just almost always happens the day of or the day before. Not surprising, but now you can actually see it in real time. So now we see 90 plus percent correct 
in the challenge activities for the first three sections, 80s and 70s for the last three. But now you can say, OK, I'm going to class later that day. This is our trouble point, heat capacity. So whatever that concept is, now we've quantified that oh, less than 80% of the students have gotten these questions right. Why is that? Why don't we throw another example like that into my class for today? So very nice and easy data to see in real time. At different time points, you can just select the data, and it'll give you the reading and challenge activity rates. So as a rheologist, I'm always asking my students to reproduce the data. In a human subject setting, not so easy. But what we're seeing is that a lot of the trends from year to year are the same. And it starts with a very high reading rate. So we're going to quantify what very high reading rate is. That this reading participation or effort does correlate with the final grades. And I'll, I'll quantify that for everyone. And then the third one is a very surprising thing that I have no idea what it means. But in my engineering classes, I have somewhere between 35 and 40 percent women. And every year, for the three years we've done this, the women read more than the men. And it's statistically significant when we aggregate the data. And so I don't know what this means, but I've measured it. Okay. So it, it's very good. But the data sets are huge, too. We're talking about 300,000-ish clicks that we've aggregated in this next slide. We're at about you know, a little over 280 students. So now we're, we're into you know, engineer land. We're going to make a plot with lots of data on it. Okay? So this is called a box whisker plot, where on the y-axis we have reading rate, 0 to 100% reading by the clicks, about 100 students in each cohort for three straight years. And the whiskers tell you this is the lowest student we've had all semester. Um, so that, those get down to the 20 to 40% as most students. The bottom of the box is what's called the first quartile. So at least three quarters of the students read that much or more. The middle line is the median grade. The first quartile are 25% of the students read to the top of the box. The triangles are the average reading rate. Okay? So the average much lower than the median because there's a few low readers that, that, that drag it down. This is not a great way to look at it. Okay? So let's zoom in on where all the data actually is up top. Okay? So we'll do that on the next slide. So now instead of 0 to 100, we're starting at 80. Our base rate was 20 to 40. Our plot here is starts at 80, and it goes up to 100. So we can see the first quartile score, these, the second and third year we did this, was 100%. The median got up to 99%, was 98% these last couple of years. So it's gone up a little bit each year. And what I'm being told by the upperclassmen is that they tell all the students I teach, usually freshmen, that, that this is free points. You got to do the reading. He's given you free points. And so um, I think we'll probably see a similar reading rate this year. But I think what's most impressive and helpful to me is that the first quartile reading rate here was above 90%. So at least three to quarters of the class are doing 90% of the reading. How much effort is 90% of the reading over the course of the semester? About 1,200 clicks. So it's a very, very large amount of effort put in over the 15 weeks of the semester. Okay. So we have 90%. Uh, first quartile reading rate this last year. So now let's compare that base rate data from the, the 2000 paper that I showed earlier to our current data. And so, you know, very statistically significant result. There's no real comparison between the two. Obviously, the technology is very different. It's hard to compare apples and apples, but this at least gives us a, a perspective on where these reading rates are. Go ahead, another question. Okay, so, so the, question, the question is, do we only look at the, the data in aggregate like I'm showing here? Obviously, I'm not going to put up Jane Doe's and John Doe's reading grades. Yes, you can very quickly pull up, okay, I think this is a student who missed the last quiz or hasn't come to class for a week. You can pull up their reading data in real time and pick the day and time that you want to see when they were doing it or not. And you could intervene, absolutely. I've actually proposed that in, in a conference uh, talk that I've given in the recent years. You know, what metric do we use uh, to, to say, oh, OK, you're not putting in the effort. I'm going to actually come and talk to you. I want you to come and talk to me uh, to be more engaged in the class. Great point. Go ahead. But what happens to the reading rates in traditional textbooks when you provide an incentive like this? So mm -hmm. in that psychology study, they just gave a random pop quiz. Right, right. What if you tell students, 
we're going to give you random reading pop qui quizzes mm -hmm. throughout the semester, and 5% or 10% of your course grade is going to depend on these pop quizzes. It's a great idea. I, I would say that, yeah, having an incentive to read is, is critical. And so can we get static textbooks to be read more if we have this, this threat of a pop quiz, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, yeah, I'm sure it would be better than 20 to 40 percent. Would it be this high? I doubt it. I think the interactivity is really engaging for the students. All right, so our last survey question, I think, in here is where is the biggest change in effort? Why did I ask this question? Because the data and what my intuition told me are completely wrong. So let's uh, actually I'll quickly look here. Um, so it looks like the biggest fraction of the respondents, more than half, said between B and C. Okay. My intuition would have been C to D, but the survey's right. So thank you for responding. You knew exactly what it was. So here's what the data looks like. Here we're talking three, uh, 286 students reading on the y-axis starting at 65% going to 100%. A students, B students, C students, D students, F students. The p-value here indicates how different the A is from the B, the B is from the C, the C is from the D, B is from the F. Smaller value means it's more significant, more different. Um, so we see that A and B students read almost all of it entirely, all the time. And there's not much difference. Okay? A and B students are putting in a lot of effort. Then we see the, not only does the median significantly drop, from 99% to 95%. This is a significant drop in this type of data. But we see the spread of the data expands from you know, here only about 5 or 6% to here we're talking uh, more than 15%, if I remember right. And then we see that, that the reading rates continually go down with each grade category. So with that large of a student group, there's at least 25 students in any, any category here for a single grade. And so we see this change in effort. Another question. Ah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is, is the reading helping them get an A or a B? And that's not what I'm trying to imply here. I, I agree with that, that point of view. What I'm saying here is that 80 plus percent of their grade, 80 percent of their grades are exams and quizzes, so that's independent of the reading. So it's not confluence of grades here. But what I, I'm saying is that reading can quantify effort, and effort seems to be related to how well they do in the class. And so, motiv motivation is another way to put it. Yeah, I guess less motivated students don't read as much uh, than than others. Of course, that that's that's going to be true. Yeah, they don't come to class, of course. That, uh, that's very, very true. We all know that fact. Okay. But so there's a big, big dip between B and C. So I, I thought that was a somewhat surprising result and quite quantitative. And so the last part here is on, on repetition. So do students do those reruns on the animations? And then do students use those challenge activities as extra practice? In all of my classes, students are always like, can I have more practice problems? Can I have more practice problems? Now I can give them as many as they want. Okay. So for the animations, here we're plotting the view rate from 95 to 120%, so we don't go down to zero here, across eight of the chapters of the book. And we see that seven of the eight are above 100%, and chapter eight did a measly 98% view rate of the animation. Okay. So this was just one cohort of data, about 100 students, 14,000 animation views, about 1,000 reruns here. I do. So, so is this what you would expect? Ah. So, so it's like the content in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 mm -hmm. is, the, is the content a little more complex than you would expect it to be? So the question is about, so does, do the bar sizes tell you about how difficult the content is or why they would want to repeat? Uh, to some extent, no. I think that that most of these from, from 2 to 7 are about the same value. What we see is that chapter 1 over the years has had a higher 
view rate because animation is a new platform. So the first one or two animations of the book will have by far the highest animation view rate because they were like, what the heck is this? Oh, I should have read the caption in step two, and now step four is going on. And so I think that, that once they get used to the animations, that's why chapter one is the biggest. Um, why some of the other chapters and in individual animations are more watched, I think it depends on um, how they relate to problems that they're doing, homework problems. That's one thing we've seen. There are certain uh, sticky concepts in, in this book, and we've seen them year to year that are in the top 10 most viewed animations, and so we, we put that into our last paper that's under review right now. So that's a good question. So reruns common. So now let's compare reading, which is just clicks and effort, motivation as we were talking about, and the participation score on, on the left, to actually having to do a computation correctly in most cases. We don't limit the number of attempts. Uh, usually these are numbers with a tolerance. I think we talked about that a little earlier, and, and multiple choice is common. Sometimes there's chart reading questions. Sometimes there's two answers they have to put in at once, other things. So here's our last bit of data for, for the talk. We have average number of attempts per student on the y-axis across eight chapters, uh, about 300 questions here. And we have blue bars with orange bars on top. And this is where big data lies to us. So I'm going to fill that in too. So, so be, uh, be curious about what the data is telling you. So obviously chapter one and two have easier content than the rest of the chapters. It's the blue bars are lower. They're, it's only taking about one attempt to get any of those right. Um, what we see is that every chapter has an orange bar on top. Okay, so there is extra attempts in, in about 4,000 extra attempts, or about 14 per question across the book. So somebody is going back and practicing these after they get it correct. The orange is only after they've gotten that exact question level correct. Okay. So that's a good sign, lots of, lots of extra attempts. But what's wrong with chapter 8 is then the question. Okay. So this is a good case study, right? Chapter 8, this is where the data lies. That's totally wrong data. Because I had one student. These students, so there, I have a few students who struggle with the math concept called integration. So if you know calculus, you know what integration is. Okay? And they refuse to embrace learning one or two integrals that we teach them. Okay? So this student had been through the book, saw how the rolling numbers work, and they saw, OK, I'm going to take the wrong answer from the first one. I'm going to put it in the box again and hit check. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to do that again. And you know what? It worked 438 times later. It took, took somewhere in between 25 and 35 minutes when we look at the, at the you know, we were all very curious when we saw numbers that call. Um, so the, the problem for probably the B or C student would have taken them five to eight minutes to do at most, probably getting it wrong a couple times. The student put 25 plus minutes into not even trying. Eventually, they got it right. A lot okay. Of put in no effort. Yeah, no effort. Eventually, they got it right. More time, less effort. Okay. And so, if we take out the outliers from this data, what we're going to see is that. Both chapter 8 and chapter 6 have this idea of integration in them, and I have this small subset of students who don't want to do it. And so we see that the eight attempts before correct now went to about half of what it was. So that's only taking the 100 plus attempters out. Sometimes students will take 7 to 10, almost 15 attempts, we'll see sometimes. But this only took out the 100 plus attempters, the real outliers here. It was a very small number, but they skew the data tremendously. You know, when we're comparing three attempts to 300 or 400 attempts, uh, it does skew the data a lot. And it's not just the A students who are doing these extra attempts. That surprised me a little bit. I expected the 20 to 30 percent of the class to get A's or A's and B's. Actually, it's more than that with A's and B's. But here we see somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of the class in any single chapter will have gone back and done an extra attempt on a, on a problem within that chapter. So that accounts for a lot of students. So I, I really thought that was a really encouraging result for this type of material. Matt, on, on that mm -hmm. Go back mm -hmm. to yep. Class. Yeah. Isn't there a bonding effect across the level? Uh, yes. Yes, because the quartiles don't change. The high and the low, the and the low would, would be very, very skewed. Right. Exactly right. 
Yeah, so, so the question was about box whisker plot of this. Yeah, obviously the whiskers would, would show the max of the 400 off the chart. All right, so I told us we would talked a lot about solutions manuals and, and how we're doing that with auto grading and rolling numbers. Here we'll talk about cost. So the, the book that I've offered for MEB, or Material Energy Balance, is the course I've been teaching, um, is $58 from Zybooks they, 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 per student. That's what most of the books cost. The spreadsheet book is a little shorter if you want it standalone, much less expensive. Um, so it's always fully interactive. It's always auto-graded. It's all inclusive. Um, the major product competing in the, this MEB class is from a major publisher. It's been around for several decades. Um, I found it as, as inexpensive for a static electronic text as, as much as $60, so very comparable. But when I went to the university bookstores, especially at the author's institution, I found that if you wanted the book and some online tools that they have, it was you know more than $100 more per student. So the $10 for spreadsheet set, if you want to have a feature that includes spreadsheet. No, so it's a, it's a shorter book. It's not a full semester book. That's oh, why it has a less okay. price. So the spreadsheet book is not intended, at least right now, it's not intended for a full semester three credit course, which most of the other books are intended for. So, you know, I think this is saving, you know, here with 100 students a year, $100 a book, that's a lot of money. Okay. Big, big difference there. And so, for an interactive textbook perspective, what have we learned? We've learned that if students can see their reading, they're going to go and do it. If we give them that carrot, and that incentive to do it. Not only will they read it, they'll use it, they'll reuse it. And so we have saw that both in the challenge activities and in the animation. And finally, the reading effort will kind of be a predictor of how well they're going to do on the quizzes and the exams, which is what determines their grade. So here's a slide I just leave up. Lots of references that were mentioned throughout some books earlier, um, some of the conference proceedings papers and, and our papers. So I'm happy to share the slides with anyone who wants to, to have links to, to any of these, some of our work and, and other people's. And so one slide to finish here. So instead of the main points of the talk, I thought I'd put some of the main questions of the talk in, in the last slide. So I think, I hope you came in here and had an idea of what a textbook was, and that opinion has changed. That a textbook is not one thing. It shouldn't be a static thing. If we want students to use it, we need to put these incentives in place and mechanisms in place to get them to read. And the hypothesis was students can read the textbook. We've shown a lot of data showing that they can. So interaction creates effort. We talked about multi-sensory things. And we said that effort counts twice. So my opinion is we can get more and more effort. We'll get more and more learning. And we'll get better results from more of the students. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Happy to take more questions. Other questions before we wrap up? Yeah. So, Jordan talked essentially about you know, exploring some different textbook options. Like one of the pushbacks that I get is, oh, I don't have time to, to do whatever they imagine. But, but based on what you're saying, it sounds like there is Right. Okay. So, so the question is, um, librarians are very helpful for faculty, especially here at the University of Toledo. I love our librarians. Um, how, they're, they're, we're trying to help faculty adopt new textbooks or new technologies in this domain. You know, how much effort does it take? Well, obviously, it takes it takes some effort to change. But like the perusal tool, you could use the same textbook and have this tool added on. And now you're adding this level of engagement for the students, I think, which is great. Uh, the other perspective I take, you know, trying to, to keep the students at the center of this, is that every, you know, every professor I've ever talked to about, okay, so you, would you consider using my interactive book for this class? And the responses always start with, well, I, well, I, and it's never, I've never gotten a response, well, the student are successful because, or the students use the tool because. And so the perspective and the mentality is, is off, in my opinion, um, from what I've seen. And I think that, that, that that's an important thing to consider in this argument. Other questions 
before we wrap up? Well, I know I certainly learned a lot of new material, and uh, we'll rethink how I kind of view textbooks. Hopefully you have too, and you can take some of this information back to your colleagues. I agree this is a, a fantastic way to really engage our students in, in learning and some alternative ways of, of viewing material. And I think your data was really eye-opening as well. I, I think we sometimes assume, oh, they're reading it. And uh, I think we have to find some other ways to make it interesting and of value for them. So fantastic. I know uh, Matt's going to stay afterwards if you have questions and please follow up with him. You have an evaluation. If you would fill that out and leave it on the back table before uh, you leave, that provides some valuable feedback for us. So thanks again for coming today. We appreciate you being here.